Um, so if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Daniel chapter 9. We're going to finish up Daniel chapter 9. We're actually going to finish up our study this week uh, in Daniel. And actually chapters 10 through 12 are the same vision. And they start to kind of repeat themselves about what they're talking about a little bit. But there's some highlights that I wanted to touch base on um, so we can get the, a good picture of what's going on. But last time we were together, we really established that Daniel was two things. He was a student of God's word. He was vigorous in it. He understood it. He, he dove into it and wanted to know about it. And what made him successful also as being a faithful man of God was he had a, a, an extremely powerful prayer life. Not when it mattered most, but every single day he went to the Lord in prayer. And in Daniel chapter nine he starts praying because he has to come to grips with um, remember what was Daniel's name do you remember what it means God is my judge so he's been living the exile the entire time and he's been pr he's praying in chapter 9 as he starts to end uh, his, his, his life on earth and he's realizing that God is a righteous judge even though I was in exile, even though I was going through all this, he's still a righteous judge. And then he steps up and he stands in the gap, which he's been doing the entire time, but even more so because he realizes when he was reading Jeremiah here in chapter 9 that the 70 years of captivity is done. He, they get to go home. They're headed back home. But before that, we get this glimpse of the angel Gabriel comes to him and he talks to him and he, what he's going to do is he's going to give him a bigger picture. Even bigger than, yes, Jerusalem being rebuilt because the, the walls are in total desolation. There's not even one brick on top of each other. That's going to be great and bring God's or glory to God's name. But God has a much bigger picture than just rebuilding the walls around Jeremiah's hometown. Much bigger. God wants to restore people's souls that he can live inside them in fullness of relationship. Like Sherry was talking back before the garden even began, that was the plan. He wanted to be with us, to dwell with us. And we know through Scripture, he teaches us that it's his desire that no one should perish, but that everyone would come to know him and have everlasting life. So let's pick it up in verse 24 here in chapter 9. So this is the, the angel Gabriel is speaking to him. And he says, Seventy weeks are decreed about your, your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and prophet and to anoint a most holy place and in verse 25 he goes on to say now therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one a prince there shall be seven weeks then for then 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat but in a troubled time and after the 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end shall come with a flood and to the end there shall be war desolations are decreed and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for Half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So I just want to make this really simple tonight, what he's talking about. So Daniel, he, his eyes right now are on building the temple, rebuilding the walls, rebuilding Jerusalem and making it great again. Uh, but God is showing him, look, captivity is done. And yes, you're going to get to watch all the people start to return home, Daniel. You've been a good and faithful servant. You saw them taken out of Jerusalem. You will see them start to go back. But Gabriel says, but that's the 70-year period that we were talking about with you. But there's a 70-week period still to come. And what Gabriel is talking about is when God is going to set up first his kingdom on on earth in, the, in man's hearts. He's going to set up his will to be done through us as Christians today. And then one day, he will still come and actually completely rule and reign the heavens and the earth. And he will take away uh, man's rule forever. And it will be just him. So if I can get this to work tonight. I might get closer. There we go. So... I want to break this down. So he's talking about 70 weeks, which is translated 77-year periods. So we're looking, it's, it's a lot longer than a week. And the time period is broken down, and he breaks it down in two different segments. The first one's what I want to focus on right now. And the first one, he says, it, it totals up to a 69-week period. Um, and 
What's important to understand, what most scholars get this wrong and what most people that teach it get it wrong, is the Jewish calendar only has 360 days in it. It does not have 365 like ours. That's why they keep missing it when they try to see what this is actually talking about. Um, So what we're actually looking here for is different than our calendar system. So we're looking at 69 sets of 360-day periods, which actually comes out to be 173,880 days. Okay, so we're looking a little bit different. And what he's saying is there's a time when the wall is going to be rebuilt to a time that anointed one is going to come. And I want to point this out to you that from March 14th, 445 BC is when Nehemiah said, we're going to rebuild the walls. It's time to go back. And from that time till April 6th, 32 AD is exactly 173,880 days on the Jewish calendar when Jesus rides in on the donkey and everybody's proclaiming what? Hosanna, the king has arrived. Exactly to the day did Gabriel predict this this time period. And what God is doing here with Daniel, he's looking at just the small return to Jerusalem, but God's saying, look, I see the bigger problem of sin itself, and I am going to send a Savior, Jesus, which is my only begotten Son, to conquer the hearts of man through his death and resurrection. And Daniel, you know, he's coming, but you're not going to see him. You've seen the mirror of it as I return the people of Jerusalem home, but there's one greater than even you coming. There's one greater than all the prophets before you and after you, all this. And he tells them to kind of keep being faithful because I'm going to take care of the bigger picture of sin. And what happens is there's one, there's one week left. So there's 69 weeks that's all right here to the day, to the day, 173,880 days. That is miraculous in itself. But then we still have one period left. And in between that, the blue block, that's just us. That's a church period. That's us today that we get to proclaim that, hey, he's already fulfilled this prophecy. It's already there. He's already done this to the day. How miraculous is that? But there's still one to come, which is dealing with the end time, the last world ruler that we've been talking about throughout Daniel. Um, but he's dealing with this. that um, he's, We call it the tribulation period, and we call it that. But it's man's last-ditch effort to do one thing, is to defy God and to spread spit on the grace that he has given them for so many years, saying, look, you can come be with me, accept Christ as your Savior, you can walk right into the most holy of holies with me, and man just says, I refuse your grace. It's done. And after that last seven years, the scripture says in verse 27, the end of the desolator, so that ruler will be finished when that's all said and done. And that's when Jesus will set up his kingdom and take the authority away from man forever. Um, but between those two periods, that's us. That's the age of grace that we live in. So what does that mean? That's, that's the time that we're working in right now. Um, the kingdom by what? Loving others. We're reaching out to them uh, until this prophecy is fulfilled and complete. So the application here from chapter 9, what I was just thinking about, with, with all these crazy visions that Daniel's seeing, there's stuff that we can take home today. And the biggest thing is that we, we know that all of mankind will rebel. It's, it's there. It's going to happen. But, we can, but God is still going to accomplish what he set out to do. He's going to accomplish his plan in things. So in chapters 10 and 12... Let's move on from chapter 9. So he's getting that big picture. He's going to send his Savior. He's going to send his Son. In chapters 10 and 12, it's the last vision that God gives to Daniel, and it runs together. And it's actually two years after the people start returning to Jerusalem. So imagine his time frame. Daniel's going to be excited. He's he's, he's overwhelmed with, we're no longer captive to Babylon. We're no longer captive, captive to just Persia. We can go home. We can worship the Lord like he told us we could. We can rebuild our homes and our temple and worship him. But Daniel, as he's doing this, he's witnessing this, the, the return of the exile. But now he sees the beginning of this restoration of God's people after a time of repentance that we saw in chapter 9. But during this time period when everything looks like it's going well, usually that's when people start getting complacent. It's usually when people start, like, you know, I, I, I kind of put the kingdom work on the back burner because it's not as important, it's not as prevalent to me. But all of a sudden, in chapter 10, God lifts this veil of beauty, of the, of the temple being rebuilt, of the walls being rebuilt, the people coming together. And he reveals to Daniel behind this veil, the spiritual world, this battle going on for man's souls that we sometimes never will ever, ever see. And that's what I, if I can get this to work, well, there we go. So 
he reveals to him, he sees Daniel as this veil is removed from his eyes and he looks into the spiritual world. He sees this terrifying unnamed angel of the Lord and Daniel's eyes are open to what he's seeing though is that the conflicts that we talked about, all the empires that struggle back and forth for supremacy and for authority, they mirror exactly what's going on in the heavens right now that we don't even realize and all we're worried about is what we're going to have for dinner if our sports team one today. And that's probably what Daniel was kind of thinking about. Hey, what color is the temple going to be? What are we going to paint the walls? And God's saying, look, don't be relaxed just because things are going well. There's still things going on. So in chapter 10, let's look at verse 7 as this angel appears to Daniel. And it says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So the first thing that stood out to me, God is looking for those who will not run away from the weight of following Christ. They will not run away from the weight of the gospel. He wants people to answer that call and stand in the gap like Daniel started in, in chapter 9, where he was standing in the gap, repenting even with himself. He was, he was involved with everything that was going around, around with him. Um, and this vision vision of war, though, is going on in the heavens, and what happens? It's just, again, it's too much for Daniel to even handle physically. It's where we pick it up in verse 8. He says, So I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. So remember, he's in his late 80s. This, this is hard for him to deal with. And it's interesting because angels are like us. They're created beings. They're not, they're not to be worshipped. They just do the work of the Lord. We don't seek them. We don't worship them. We don't, uh, they're not to be sought after. But I also want to understand that you'll see those little pictures. They're not naked babies playing the harp either. They are powerfully made to do one thing. It's for God's bidding. And anytime men and women would see angels in the Old Testament, oftentimes they would fall on their face and this beautiful statement would come after from the angel and he would say, fear not. Because it was just too overwhelming for them to deal with. Uh, it would follow their appearance. That's what we find Daniel in verse 12. If you skip down, he goes, Then the angel said to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. So the, the thing we can take away, the first thing that God does for Daniel in this vision is he assures, he reassures him of what's going on, that the, the angel was sent to help. This supernatural, powerful aid uh, was helping him to live a faithful and God-fearing life that he had no idea about. And today, we don't live in the dark like this. Who do we have with us? We have been empowered with the Holy Spirit, not a created being, but God himself in us that helps empower us to live a faithful, godly life today. And what does God call us? We're more than conquerors. Why? Because the spiritual battle is already defeated. But we, we see here that there's still a real spiritual warfare that's going on, and it's over the message of the truth. And today we would call it the gospel. It's the message of God going out to a lost world. There's still a spiritual battle that picks up in verse 13. It says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now this is a spiritual, spiritual being. This is not a physical. Um, it, it, he withstood me for 21 days, the angel is saying. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I was left there with the king of Persia. And there is a spiritual opposition against the gospel. We have to realize that. But what's so beautiful about this is it, as difficult as it may sound, you know, he had some opposition. It took him 21 days to get there. But it just reminds me that God breaks through the most poignant defense the enemy has on people, the most um, enrooted or the most broken or, or, or whatever is going on. He blows through those defenses. Why? Because Daniel was crying out to him. Nothing was going to stop God from getting to Daniel, all because he humbled himself and he cried out to God. And then, he did, then what he does is he empowers him for the message of the truth. And that's what we do today. Jesus says, I empower you in such a way that when he said it, he said, the gates of hell will not prevail. Think about that. They're not coming to our camp. Where has God put us at to save souls? At hell's gate. That's where we're at. That's where he put us. He said, this is where the lost are. This is where we're at tonight. And then God, he, at first, he assures Daniel. And then he does this beautiful thing. 
God touches Daniel. And what he does is he gives him strength for the message in verse 16. Listen to this. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and jumped down to verse 19. And he goes, and he said, O man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened. And I said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. So God is just reaching down saying, look, I'm empowering you to spread the message of what's going on. Even though you physically can't do it, I'm going to give you supernatural power to proclaim my truth. And that's what the Apostle Paul, he had that same experience. The gospel, uh, it was supernaturally powered through the Holy Spirit in him. And this is what Paul would say about it in Romans 1.16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now you have Paul. He's an angry, self-righteous murderer. And he has no problem proclaiming the gospel. Why? Because God empowers us each to proclaim it, not because we should be ashamed of our own weakness or our past or failure. He takes it over because it becomes about his power, about what he's done. And you know, as broken as we are, as, as, as bad off as we've become, all that is is a testimony of where God has brought us to where we are now. And that's the message saying, look, it has nothing to do with me. Before God, I screwed up everything. I messed it all up. My life was a total chaos, but now he's entered my life and there's something different and I want you to know it so he's proclaiming it it's not about our failures so not only does God assure Daniel he gives him strength but in verse 14 he instructs him about the message in verse 14 he goes and and he came in to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days for the vision is for days yet to come so God has fully equipped us for spiritual warfare he's covered us in his spiritual armor not our own we don't we don't we don't walk around as warriors we walk around as more and conquerors because the, the the battlefield has already been leveled for us and that's what Ephesians 6 says we are in the spiritual armor of God we're we're protected we're safe but if we're safe and secure in Jesus why show Daniel why show Paul into the spiritual realm why do they need to know and it boils down to this it's so that we don't take lightly our times that Jesus paid so that we could be in the word so he could bring this to us it, it, we don't take lightly the times that we're in prayer when we actually go get to stand before God in his presence and pray for things that are actually going on in our world today we don't take it lightly we understand the, the magnitude behind it and it's interesting because in humanity the adversary's face always changed. There's always a different leader. There's always a different persecutor. But behind the scenes, it's the same old battle spiritually that's been going on and that's been waged for centuries and for millennial. And Ephesians 6.12, Paul writes it like this. He reminds us, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Say that with me. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The people persecuting us, the people hurting us, the people going through it, that's not even the focus of Paul here. Because he says, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then he reminds us in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So he's reminding us that the persecution when it hits, when those family members talk about us, or those friends hit us, or our enemies, or even our neighbor, whatever form it takes from, it is not them that's pushing that or driving that. Where's it really coming from? The spiritual, okay? They're being influenced. They're doing this. It doesn't make them... um, Innocent. That's why we have sin. That's why we have a choice. But we realize the driving force that we're never going to get to that person one-on-one physically. It's going to have to be a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit to reach that individual. So in chapter 10, God assures us and assures Daniel. He strengthens Daniel just like he strengthens us. He teaches us just like he taught Daniel. And then he goes before us in the spiritual battle. It's already conquered. Daniel, I want you to look and see what's going on. I've already fought this battle because you prayed, because God heard you and he sent me and I came. And God is looking for those who will not run like Daniel's friends, but he will stand firm or we will stand firm in what God has already accomplished for us. 
And that's where we go into chapter 11, the same vision. So if you haven't noticed, we're doing a flyover. Uh, it's a little bit different tonight, but that's okay. We, there's, some, there's some great meat here. So in chapter 11, we get a little bit more just proof of how good and how gracious and how great and how wise and how God knows everything and controls everything. What he does is he gives us uh, the number of kings and how they're going to arise from the, the remaining three empires. So we have already had Babylon. They're already gone. Uh, Persia's now. We're waiting on Greece to come and then they're still waiting on Rome to come. But he just, he just shows Daniel, I want to I give you just proof of who I am and how great of a God I am. So showing us that his authority and power is above all else. So I want to just give you a few of the names that go through here. I won't go through all the verses. Uh, but in verse 2, it talks about that in Persia, it has four kings. And we know that. So that, again, this hasn't happened for Daniel yet. All we know about is Cyrus. So Cyrus is there. Um, uh, Cambyses, D- D- uh, Darius, and Xerxes. And he's the, Xerxes is that one he calls is the fourth and final. He was the most wealthiest king of all of Persia. So he, he's just telling who's coming. In verse 3, he talks about the mighty king of Greece. We know that as Alexander the Great. It still has not come to pass in Daniel's day. In verse 4, it says um, that Greece is, or this, this empire was to be divided into the four winds. And that's exactly how it played out. When Alexander died, it became Greece, Asia Minor, Asia Minor Syria, and then Egypt. That all came to pass. In verse 5, it says, there's a king of the south, um, and that was uh, Nicator. He was one of the most powerful of Alexander's successors, and he came up out of Egypt from the south after Alexander died. So again, he's just talking verse by verse, and as you look in history, you can see that God painted a perfect picture for this. Even as This weird verse is between 6 and 8. talks about this daughter, and her name was um, Berenice, and she was a daughter that was given to bring um, two warring factions together. And what happened is, during, after she got married, she was murdered. So um, so Syria, the one that did this, was overthrown because of the murder that she had. This was perfect, and it's, it's it's what it says here, is that a branch from her roots shall rise a great victory. So her relatives came up and overthrew Syria and took over more land. There was a great victory because of what happened to her. And then it goes, it keeps listing all the way down, um, and it reveals how each power transfers hands over and over again just to prove that I am God, I know what's going to happen, and I know exactly how it's going to happen. And he goes all the way down to verse 32. We covered this guy already, uh, Antiochus. Remember, he was the one that he slew the, the pig and he wiped it all over the, the temple and all these things. That was this guy. And even down to verse 32 through 35, he talks about how the Maccabean revolt would actually overthrow him and remove him out of power. Why do we, why do we have this in the Bible? If God is this accurate on prophecy that's still centuries away from happening, how accurate is he when he made us? How accurate is he when he put us with our spouse? How accurate is he when he gave us our offspring? How accurate is he? When he calls us to how to live, should we listen to a God that knows all this? When he calls us to love others, should we listen? Anything that he says, should we be obedient? His way is best for us because he knows every thing about us because he made us and he has everything planned for us and what this chapter does it should remind us that we stand in awe of a God who knows everything and even more so he loves us exactly where we're at in the midst of all this when I look at this I'm like there's there's bigger fish to fry than coming down and saving Dwayne Beavers but he loves us that much he loves us that way that we're to follow after him. He, he came for each and every one of us. And then verses 36 through 45 of chapter 11, the angel just reveals the last days, the final ruler, and when, and when Jesus is going to return. And I think verse 36, he's talking about this final ruler, and it personifies this, this guy's rule. And it just says, And the king shall do as he wills. That's just mankind in a nutshell. And eventually, what do we do? We make this representative of everything that's black in our heart, everything that that is low about us, we make this individual our leader. But it just reminds me that as the world spins, man only gets worse. It just gets worse. But 
as it comes to head with this final ruler, what application do we have of this? What application do we have 2,600 years later from Daniel to bring into our lives today? And we have to go back to Daniel chapter 10. What did he do? What did God reach down and do for Daniel when he was, this is too much for me to handle? He strengthened him. He gave him might to do the work at hand. And it just reminds me, this, this makes my faith strengthen that we serve an awesome God. That he knows all these things. And Paul said it like this concerning spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6.10. He says, finally. That's a, that's a huge word. This is what's most important. Finally, guys, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So what should people be doing with all this craziness that Daniel's talking about and all these visions that are still going on? And it just reminds me that we are to stand strong because of what God has done. We are to step out in crazy faith because of what God has got going on and daring faith because it doesn't matter what persecution's coming. God has it all under control because our, what's, our, what's our purpose? There are souls that are still on the line. There are people's lives that matter that don't know him, that don't believe in him. And it boils down to, do we believe this? Do we believe that this is an urgency? Do you believe that this is an urgency? Daniel's a book of proof that we serve the right God. If you move on to Daniel chapter 12, we're going to read this one out, out loud. Uh, but before I do this, I want you to understand this prophecy is dealing with the Jewish people in end times. It's not us. It's the Jewish people. Uh, but what I want you to focus on is God's the Jewish people have always been God's people, just like we were grafted into that through faith, through our coming to, to know the, the, the Father through Jesus. We're grafted into that same family, but this is the, the bloodline of the Jewish heritage. But look at them as God's people through this. God never leaves them alone. He is with them, and he gives a specific representative in the form of an angel. He shows Daniel that this angel, Michael, is going to be with them. He's going to get them through this, and when it's all said and done, as, as bad as things get, I will deliver them. I will still deliver them. So let's pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 12. We're just going to read this all the way through. It's just 13 verses. It says, And in that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge over your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one at this bank of the stream and one on the bank of the, st um, of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward the heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time and times and a half time and that when the shattering of the, of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things should be finished. In verse 8 he says, I heard but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the, until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from that time the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 13 and, or 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. So again, another just kind of crazy vision. Um, but I want to pick out a few things here. First, we are not alone in our walk. We are never alone. It may feel that way. We may get bombarded. It may feel like there is nothing left um, that is any resemblance of relationship. But just like Daniel and the people of Israel see, we see that today where Jesus said, what? I'll never leave you, forsake you. I will follow you even until the ends of the world. And that's what he reassures Daniel with in verse 1. He says, but at that time, your people shall be delivered. 
Why? Because he's been walking with them the entire time. God will deliver the Jews after this great tribulation. But for us as believers who won't be there, it says most will have died. They'll be in the dust. And what does he say? For those guys, they shall awake to everlasting life. There's that final enemy that we realize that death, even death itself, cannot stop God. He is with us. That's who we serve. Uh, Matthew 13, 43 says, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who has ears. Let him hear. This is talking about our retirement plan. This isn't a 401k or, you know, I need to, I need to trade up my house. The one, the one I have isn't good enough to, to lash me. This is, this is a real retirement plan. And for us in the Northwest, you know, who would have never seen sun, there's going to be sun in heaven. Think about that. Just hold on. It will happen for us. But what it boils down to is no matter what happens in our life, no matter who comes against us, what spiritual forces there, we are taken care of all the way to the end. So what application can we get out of Daniel chapter 12? So verse 3, it teaches us that we are to seek to win others, to save them for Jesus. It calls us that we are to shine in the darkness. That's what we're made to do. That's what we have been bought with a price to do. We are to shine when it's at its darkness for His glory. So we're to, uh, we're to seek to win others. Verses 8 and 9, it tells us that we are to know about prophecy, but we're to leave the hidden things that haven't come yet to God. Do you think Daniel, in all of his wisdom, as much as he studied, he would have been the one that would have understood all these things. But what did he do? I don't understand everything. And he was okay with it. God, if I did, that would make me who? God. But I'm okay that I'm not. I serve a God who knows everything, and I'm going to leave it in his hands. Verse 10, it tells us that we're to grow in holiness. Well, what does that mean? It means we become more like Christ. We submit the areas that we don't like. We submit our emotions, our time, our effort, our children, our families, our, our jobs, everything. We submit it over to him, and we become more like him. We love in those areas where he's called us. That we, When we become more like him, what do people do? They see Jesus more clearly. We become more holy. Verses 12 and 13, it says we are to wait on Jesus. What does that mean? We, we trust that God has everything in his hands and that we rest in assurance. We don't have to worry about our salvation. We don't have to work toward anything to, to earn our way into heaven. It's already been paid. It's taken care of. But we are waiting. What it means waiting, it's like um, a woman that's pregnant. When she's waiting for the baby, what is she really doing? She's nesting. She's getting the room ready. She's buying the crib, the curtains, the baby clothes, uh, the diaper cream, the diapers, everything. So while she's waiting on the baby to be delivered, she's getting ready for the baby to come. And that's what we're doing. We're working, waiting for our Savior to come. And that's what all, the point of all Bible prophecy is, is to expose how great God is and that we serve Him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength because we're investing into something that's more important, it's bigger than us. And the biggest part of worship is what He told us, worship God. And the biggest thing I want you to do in return is worship Him by loving others as we love ourselves. When you read this, and there's so much things that you can just see, it's not going to end well for a lot of people. So would you agree that we have a lot of work to do for Jesus? There are still a lot of people that don't know him yet. Just look at end times if you need inspiration that we all are in need of him. Just look at it. And because of that need for Jesus, that's why we're going to, I want to change over to the book of Mark coming up in two weeks. Our, our body is young, our body is new, and we need to get back to the gospel. We need to get back to why he came, why he called us to serve. And we're going to look at him face to face through that book and realize how Jesus empowers us to serve today without fear in his power to spread the gospel. That's exactly why we're here. And we do it knowing that he will return one day. That's what Daniel's teaching us. He is going to come back, but we have work to do in the meantime. Amen? All right, let's pray.